Hello actors, welcome back to my channel. My name is Pippa and today we're going to be talking you through the fundamentals of acting Shakespeare. And in case you're wondering, well, who is she to talk about Shakespeare? I'm a massive fan of the Bard's work. And on top of that, I trained at Bristol Albic Theatre School. I've worked in a lot of Shakespeare productions. Um, and yeah, I've been a professional actress for coming up to six years now. So I love the Bard and what he does, did, or what he allegedly did. Because let's face it, I'm a firm believer that he did not write and do all of this stuff himself. If you're one of those theatre, Shakespeare, Puritans, bye bye You can go now. So if you're auditioning for drama schools, you're more than likely going to be asked to learn a classical speech, a contemporary speech, and then have to sing a song or do something else that that drama school specifically is asking for, for that course that you are applying to. So, as a general rule, a classical speech I've read up somewhere is actually something that has been written before the 1900s. Um, however, they tend to kind of normally ask for something from the restoration period or of course our buddy old pal. Do pay attention however because I know for a fact that Bristol Vic this school are no longer asking for a classical monologue at the time I'm recording this. That might well, might well change again, I don't know. So I want to give you some fundamental tips and advice on how to approach a classical speech and how to use the language, specifically Shakespeare's language, I am going to tuck into one of his monologues, and use that to inform your choices as an actor and actually use it... Just use it properly. So let's get started, shall we? I'm going to put this down because I'm, I'm doing a lot biceps and tricep exercises by carrying that around everywhere. First tip, and this is a good one for all of your auditions, get your hair out your face. This is what the panel need to see. We need to see that this is all there, that this is all working, and we need to be able to see your thoughts nice and clearly. So before you start working, I do just recommend get it out the way. Second thing, get up. As you can see for this video, I've changed it a little bit to my usual sat down tippage I'm stood up because at the end of the day when Shakespeare was writing his stuff he wouldn't have written it out and it be printed and scripted for everyone to have he pro most likely would have in my opinion from what I've researched and from what I would have probably done in those days have written out the lines for you the lines for him and then kind of told you when you need to kind of speak them can you imagine what it was like writing how they had to write back then not to mention half the people were most likely illiterate, so they wouldn't really have understood the written word. Anyway, you've got to get it up, get it into your body, and do it that way. Hands down, if you're trying to learn a Shakespeare speech and you are sat down or lying down on your bed, that being said, it's quite useful to do those sorts of things, just to mix it up and see how it goes as a rehearsal and um, experimentation phase of your practice. Get it up on your feet, especially from the off. Really, really, really important. Next step, wake yourself up a little bit. I was explaining this the other day. Do You do you, do your warm up. If you want some help on warm ups, comment below immediately and let me know before you forget and get to the end of this video. Comment now, tell me if you want anything like interactive warm ups because I'm gonna be more than happy to do that sort of thing for you because I wanna help. Do what is gonna help you get into your body. Loosen up, connect to the diaphragm, bottom of the breath. Ah, ah, Carol Fairlam, little homage to you. Ah, ah, ah. Being an actor is weird and stupid and you're probably gonna look ugly and stupid many times in your career. If that scares you, being an actor is probably not gonna be the best fit for you. So, do a little warm up. This is gonna vary for everybody. I do recommend sirening. That's a really simple thing that you can do. If you want more information on that, let me know, just to get your vocal folds operating in the correct layout. And I would also recommend doing some articulation exercises and breath exercises. At the end of the day, Shakespeare was performed in the round at the Globe. It was a big space. Costumes would have been totally different. And 
If you haven't been to the Globe, obviously COVID aside, definitely get yourself down there. And there are so many resources online showing you what a production at the Globe is like. Make sure you have a little look at them and see what it is like in that space because it absolutely informs your decisions and technique as an actor when it comes to interacting with the text that you're working on. Warming up in general is really, really important, but I think a lot of people just miss it. And even if you're doing auditions online and self tapes, I highly recommend having some sort of simple warm up that you do most days anyway, but also pre auditions to help just get you in the zone and like pumped up and get your muscles working in the correct way. If you don't have any idea about where to even begin, make sure you subscribe to this channel so that you can do your thing technically sound as an actor. So do your warm up, get your face working, your breath connected, get your posture neutral, all those things you're gonna learn at drama school, but still really useful to have in your back pocket. I always talk about my back pocket. Have them around, rolling around your back pocket, whip them out, bam, diaphragm exercises. Easy peasy. Excellent. I'm losing my mind already, hilarious. So we're gonna dip into some speeches. We are just gonna, I'm not gonna go through whole speeches, but I'm gonna pick out bits just to use as an example to show you how to use the words and the punctuation and everything that Shakespeare has given you in a beautiful little gift. Use it to your advantage. Don't fight the text. As a rule, as an actor, in any text, even if it was written yesterday, by whoever, use the text. As a writer, I've written plays, right? And when the actors skim over what you have given them, it's really disrespectful. It happens sometimes, because you're gonna play around with it. Of course, allow some grace. However, quite often a writer has painstakingly put the full stop there, or put a comma there, or used that word, or repeated that word intentionally. So as an actor, your job is to get the most out of that text, out of that language that has been written down and scripted for you to say. Your job is to bring fresh life to that word, and that line, and that script, and that play, every single time you do it. I don't wanna hear any of this, oh, it's just got a bit stale, Oh, it's really boring repeating stuff over and over and over again. That is your job. That is your job. I'm always gonna say it like it is. I wanna help you, so this is the best way to do it, to be honest. Notice the opening line of your speech. It's always a massive giveaway as to the state of mind of your character. For example, this one, act three, scene two. The Comedy of Errors, we've got Luciana, or Luciana, 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 who knows, with Antipholus of Syracuse. And she says here, and may it be that you have quite forgot a husband's office, question mark. She's asking a question. And it's kind of coming in as if we're coming into some sort of action, right? Just to give you a really quick rundown of this particular section, Antipholus of Syracuse is chasing Luciana, being all like, yeah, baby, I love you. Come here, you sexy lady. And she's like, you are my sister's husband. What the hell are you doing? But it's not her sister's husband. It's his twin, his long lost twin, who's just come out of nowhere, right? Lots of confusion of identities. Luciana is like, have you forgotten what your duties are as a husband? Okay, I'm not gonna go into like how to figure it out, but I'm just gonna like break it down really quickly here. And can we just think about what that is like? So a woman saying that to a man, and obviously we know that he's, there's all this confusion. He's just come out of nowhere, right? Lots of confusion of identities. Confusion, I, confu confusion of identities. No one knows who is who. And may it be that you have quite forgot a husband's office? Question mark. I wanna go on, but I'm gonna pause there. She's quite essentially questioning him as to whether or not he remembers that he's not a single man who could just start chasing women around. Yet that is what is going on. She's genuinely asking. General rule in Shakespeare, always play the truth of something. The comedy will often out naturally. 
in acting in general. Play the truth, the comedy will come. And have you forgotten that you are married to my sister? Essentially. Use the words that have been given. We don't need you to fluff them up and put your own little stamp on it to try and make it all kooky. Quit your kooky acting, it's boring. And it's disrespectful to the text. What I mean by quit your kooky acting is don't come in with this speech and open it. Oh, where? And, and may it be that you, you, yes, you have quite forgot a husband's office. Why the heck are you adding all this extra huff and puff and extra syllables and repetition of the words that isn't written down in there? It's been written so specifically for a reason. So please, for the love of God, stop adding extra syllables and weird sounds. He, Shakespeare's work is a feast of sounds for you to make. So use them, don't add any extras in there. That's the first thing I would say. I think sometimes when we're not too sure about what to do, we lean back on our kooky acting. I used to have it, apparently I used to do this kind of like lip acting thing all the time. Get rid of that, get rid of it. And if you don't notice you're doing anything, record yourself. Oh, have I said that before? Yes, I have. Record yourself, watch yourself back from a critical, constructive standpoint and get over it and just, you know. Hmm, let's look for another one. Now you've looked at the first sentence and the punctuation, look at the weird sounds that he gives you. The weird words like, oh, or I, I, or tush. Use the words, use them, use them, use them. Be so true to the words then nothing else you could possibly say or no other sound you could possibly make is right. Use the words. So much. I feel that like I need to like take that in at a moment myself because it's really, really important. It's really easy when you're tackling Shakespeare speech or caressing a Shakespeare speech, should I say, to breeze over the sounds and the words that you get a bit unsure about. Make a decision. It doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, but just be confident in your delivery of it. If, for example, oh yet, yeah, for God's sake, go not to these wars, you shied away from the O, oh, it just implies that you're not confident enough to actually do the work to discover what you're meant to be saying. Oh, it's such a powerful vowel sound. Oh, try saying it like that. Use it as a voice exercise. Oh, when do you make that sound? Is it when you're sad? Oh, more of a whine? Try it different ways. Oh, use all the different ways you could possibly make that sound and see which one best fit. And play around with it, experiment with it. If you're doing Lady Percy's speech from King Henry IV Part Two, and you don't do the O oh at the beginning, what are you even playing at? Oh, for God's sake, go not to these wars. You've missed an incredible opportunity there to get connected to that whole speech. That should be the anchor of that speech. Everything she is feeling should be in that O oh sound, in my opinion. Oh, she's frustrated, she's pissed off, she doesn't understand why her father-in-law is being a dickhead now and has already let her husband die. She is grieving, she is angry and she is feisty. So put that through, that vowel sound, and then it won't seem like a weird sound that you're just making because it happens to be in the monologue kind of thing. And it's the same with anything. I, I, Antipholus, look strange and frown. Find a way to make that work so that no other sound or word that your character could make would fit apart from that word. Because it doesn't fit, because it's there for a reason. It's really important to pay respect to the text and if you are unsure, make a decision and follow through with it. Going back to O, oh, there's so many different ways that we use O. Oh. Like if you're 
really sad and, and maybe more like a whiny kind of like, I'm really sad, oh. You know, people wail in certain areas of the world when they lose a loved one. Obviously in Britain, we don't really do that, but it's a really therapeutic sound. Maybe she's like, oh, is that what you're doing? Oh no, you didn't do that. Another way to interpret it. Or even like in a more jest. Oh, we do that all the time. We do use these sounds still. So find a way to make it fit your portrayal of the character in that instant. Good, we're getting there. The next thing that I'd like you to remember is that the character doesn't know they're about to do a monologue. They don't know it's a soliloquy. They don't know how long they have alone to say what they are saying. If it's, um, there's that famous speech from A Winter's Tale, Hermione says she is talking to lots of men, lots of people who are judging her, her own husband. If you're doing the Hamlet speech, to be or not to be, he's speaking to the audience and himself. He's got some confusion going on. He's not sure what is best, living or dying. But none of these characters know how long they've got to say what they've got to say. So you need to make it interesting because you're gonna get interrupted. People are gonna maybe answer you back. So really practice thinking fresh. You need to truly be having that conversation because let me tell you, back in the day at the Globe and still today when you've got a good audience, people would have shouted out, people would have spoken back to you, people would have responded viscerally and gone, <gasps> audibly it's not like you know in the theater these days we've often got people like oh she got to be quiet in the theater no like i hate it when i see people on school trips and stuff and the teachers are telling all the kids to be quiet that is not theater etiquette when you're watching a play you should get involved and be bought in that's what i truly believe theater should be like in my opinion uh, another one that I'm just thinking of as well as an opening, but I do think it is the husband's fault if wives do fall. That but immediately we know she's disagreeing with something that has previously been said. She has, she, she's making a statement, but I do think this. And can you imagine in that day and age when the character, when the actress playing, actor playing Amelia then would have said that completely heartfelt. But I do think it is their husband's fault if wives do fall. Do you think all the men in the theatre would agree with that? They probably would be like, yeah, right. It's the slut's fault. And they probably would have said that. Imagine you're doing it at the Globe. This is really a useful thing to do because then what you can do is strip it back. Do it for TV, do it for film, do it for the sake of your audition to contrast your other monologue. But it is really important to remember the landscape in which this would have all been performed back in the day. The next tip that I wanna to talk to you about is letting the words do the work. This one is a little bit misleading because you've got to work your ass off in order to let the words do the work. If you look at a ballerina, they repeat the most simplest of moves every single day, like clockwork. It is practice, practice, practice. They don't just wake up and grow up being able to get their leg up here in the most perfect, gentle développé and it's so elegant and their chest is up and their bottom leg is strong and they're balancing on point. No, it takes relentless practice to make it look that effortless. And if you, at this moment, before you're starting to train or while you're at the beginning of your career, can get to that level of discipline where you can articulate and accentuate the words in any way, in, in, the, most, in the most sticky, deep way possible, it's only ever gonna work in your favor because then you are prepared far beyond as, as far as you'd ever need to go, but you can strip it back easily. It's much harder as an actor to maybe be a famous film actor and then get thrust into a nine show a week Shakespeare play or something to technically be able to withstand that. Everything I'm teaching you is gonna put you in good stead for a 
career in the whole realm of theatre, film, voiceover and television. Go big and then rein it in as you need to. And it's the same with learning the language of a script. Go big with it in terms of muscularity. I do talk about this quite a lot, but if you want to be an actor who can sustain long-term shows, who can do anything and feel confident doing anything, having this kind of technical stagecraft behind you is only ever going to work in your favour. And it is a voice thing. It is a voice practice. So really use the words. Let's just go back to one I know I'm going to cut further forward, otherwise we're just going to get the beginning of lines. So uh, just because it's open on it. Again, Lady Percy, Act 2. Here we go. I'll do the bit that people tend to cut, and I'm not sure why they cut it, but... Oh, miracle of men. Again, oh, miracle of men. Two mmms there. Hum. It's pleasant to say. Mmm. Mmm. You say that when something smells good. Mmm. Followed by an exclamation point. Oh, miracle of men. Mmm, it's grounded, it's vibrational, it's, yeah, it's grounded, it feels, mmm, it connects the diaphragm to the voice and there's like a, um, because your lips are shut, it's obviously, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a cut off for the air, it's not like a ooh sound where the air just comes straight out between my teeth and my, my lips are open, mmm, it's like I'm, you know, almost being stifled. All of those things will inform your acting choices and come across in the most subtle, brilliant, nuanced ways. So, a oh, miracle of men. And again, mm, mm, see how that came out then when I was making that lip sound? A mm, oh, miracle of men. She's probably trying not to cry at this point. Again, just to reiterate, if you don't know this story, her husband has just died because her father wouldn't bring up his powers and support him in battle. Now this woman, Lady Percy, is without her husband, and now he's about to go and help someone else who they don't even really freaking care about. She's stressed, she's annoyed. A miracle of men. Him, did you leave? Second to none, unseconded by you, to face upon the hideous god of war in disadvantage. So you left him. Okay. Oh, I missed a bit. Hideous God of War in disadvantage to abide a field where nothing but the sound of Hotspur's name did seem defensible. So you left him. And again, if you look at the punctuation, it's going to be slightly different from text to text. I do recommend that you have more than one complete works of Shakespeare. Every bit of punctuation might be edited slightly different depending on the editor's opinion and thoughts on that. And I remember when I discovered that, it made me realise that I could have more autonomy over Shakespeare. And just to reiterate as well, like that oh miracle of men comes after a very long-winded description of all of my heart's dear Harry's attributes, okay? Um, she's talking about how his, he inspired all the chivalry of England to commit to bravery. He was a hero. He was, he was the, the most admirable person. Everyone looked up, up to him and everyone wanted to be like him and speak like him and sound like him. And yet, you left him. And that O oh, miracle of men, again, that big O oh, is a clue that that is a big climactic moment of this speech. O oh, miracle of men, him did you leave. Second to none, unseconded by you. Again, lovely play there, seconded. Really pay attention to these sounds that you are using. S is a hissing sound. Second to none, unseconded. It's a lovely play on words there. Unseconded by you. Point in the finger, literally, by you. Um, to look upon the hideous god of war in disadvantage. But she didn't just leave it there. She goes on even further. To abide a field where nothing but the sound of Hotspur's name did seem defensible, so you left him. You left him. Really play on the key phrases that he gives you here. <laughs> yeah. So I definitely talked about this in one of my other videos about tackling Shakespeare like a pro, or caressing Shakespeare like a pro. <laughs> 
really, really play on the, the sounds, the vowel sounds and the consonant sounds. Everything that is coming out of your character's mouth is crucial to them getting their point across and their emotions across. Remember, this was a visceral time. Imagine the place wherein these people were living. It was dirty, it was dark, it was disgusting. There would have been rats everywhere, urine, poo flying out of windows. Like, it wouldn't have been as glamorous as they make it out in Shakespeare in Love. <laughs> I mean, I mean, they do kind of touch on it a little bit there, but you know, a bit of dirt on your face and you look like you're a ruffian in Shakespeare's London. But actually, it would have been awful. It would have been so awful. I can't imagine what the women were going through. Children, I can't imagine the disease that would have been there. Communication would have been limited with people, which is why I think these words have lived on for so long because the sounds that he uses and the words and the imagery all complement the feeling that the character is, is getting out in one way or shape or form. The sounds that he uses and the words and the imagery all complement the feeling that the character is, is getting out in one way or shape or form. One way, shape or form. Unseconded as well. The, the sounds like s, k, g, you can deliver them all quite clipped and cutting. Shakespeare uses words that have an onomatopoeic sound to them that help portray more of what the character is about at that moment in time. Second to none, second, again, I can really go further with that, second to none, I wouldn't say it like that probably, but still as an experiment, second to none, unseconded by you. See how I'm doing all this kind of thing as well. Get that out of your system, play around with it. Once you know the general feel for the speech, go further with it. Would she be doing this to him? Probably not of that time, but still, she'd be doing it with the words. They would be the finger wagging, the dagger stabbing. Make sure you get it out of your system. Um, the hideous god of war in disadvantage. Beautiful word, that. Disadvantage. Beautiful word. Oh, I forgot how good that word is. To look upon the hideous god of war in disadvantage. Again, this hideous god, and you are in a disadvantageous situation. <sighs> to abide a field where nothing but the sound of Hotspur's name did seem defensible, so you left him. Play around with it all. And again, this is a note from my ladies out there who are doing drama school auditions. Stop playing the female characters like they are just whiny and sad. Get some freaking feist out of them. These women would have been very interesting characters. They are very interesting characters. And they're not always just like, <laughs> Another perfect one. Never, oh never do his ghost the wrong to hold your honour more precise and nice with others than with him. Precise and nice? Beautiful hiss sound. She's hissing at him at this point. Precise. Play on that word. Come on, use it. Um, and the repetition. Never. Oh. Never. See how I slowed that down then? Initially, I was a bit like, oh, I sound like my mum then, where she'd be like, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> Maybe she is like that at this point. Never. Oh. It would be so refreshing if everyone actually didn't just skim over these vowel sounds in their audition. Use them to your advantage. Um, so much fun, isn't it? See how much fun you have with it. Um, it shouldn't be this sticky, tricky thing. It should be this fun, sometimes sticky linguistically to get your lips and teeth and tongue around the words, but it should be fun playing around with all these weird sounds. You only ever do this when you're learning to speak. Do more of it. Um, so yeah, let's just, I'm just trying to think if there's any other bits there. Let them alone. And again, the punctuation here is really clear. Never, oh never. 
do his ghost the wrong to hold your honour more precise and nice with others than with him, exclamation mark. Never. Oh, never. She is, she could well be wagging her finger here at this point. Wouldn't necessarily say do that. Um, um, with him, exclamation point. She means business. Whether she's shouting it, I don't know, or whether it's just really intense. Let them alone, full stop. It's in the middle of the line. So the first two lines are, never, oh never, do his ghost the wrong, do his ghost the wrong, to hold your honour more precise and nice with others than with him. Exclamation. Let them alone. Point. The marshal and the archbishop are strong. Had my sweet Harry had but half their numbers, today might I, hanging on Hotspur's neck, have talked of Monmouth's grave. Great speech. Plenty of great speeches from women in Shakespeare's work. Tuck into them, find more of them. As you can see, I'm getting animated, I'm getting passionate about it. I'm a little bit tired from doing that. It should be somewhat of a physical workout because, like I say, these pieces would have been portrayed in a big auditorium, in a big space. And because of the sounds being made, and that diaphragm gut connection between your mouth doing the work and never, oh never, everything is working together, okay? So make sure when you're doing your Shakespeare speeches to go that far with them, first of all, and get that diaphragmatic connection going and bouncing around and then strip it back if you want to, depending on your choices as an actor. Better to get the technique down so that you can take it away and throw it away than not have it and then be forced and straining and coming across desperate on stage to be heard. Come on! Hope that was all helpful. I'm going to let all my hair down now. If you have got any other questions, please reach out to me. Comment below because... We are givers, we want to pay this all forward. And if you're thinking it, maybe someone else is thinking it who hasn't got the courage to ask it. So please ask, and I will get back to you as quickly as I can. And I have an important announcement to make. The A Sonnet A Day project is coming back. Ooh, yeah, boy. I am going to announce that very soon on my Instagram. So if you have not joined me on Instagram, make sure you do. I'm at Pippa Moss UK on there. And if you haven't subscribed or liked this video yet, make sure that you do. I update my channel with live Q&As about acting, drama school auditions, tips and tricks when it comes to drama school auditions or acting in general, mental health and the arts. I fall under that lovely wide umbrella of the arts. So yeah, make sure you, you stick around. Thanks for joining me today. Have a good evening and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.